Muy buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to hearing number 20 of the 180 regular session of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, Protection of the Human Rights of Persons in a Situation of Human Mobility in Mexico. This hearing was requested by a series of organizations of the civil society. I want to greet the state civil society organizations and also the representative in Mexico of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, Guillermo Fernández Maldonado. I am Julissa Falcón. I am the vice president, first vice president of the commission. I am with Commissioner Arosemena, country rapporteur, second vice president um, Flavia Piovesan, rapporteur for LGBTI persons, and Estuardo Ranón, a rapporteur for persons uh, deprived of liberty against torture and persons with disabilities. Also, um, Maria Claudia Pulido, and special rapporteur of social, economic, cultural, and environmental rights, Soledad Garcia. Uh, before we start, I want to explain how we're going to work. So society, we have 20 minutes, then the state 20 minutes. Then we will give the floor to Mr. Guillermo Fernandez Maldonado for seven minutes. Then the commission will have 20 minutes to conclude with comments regarding the civil society. And then the civil society and the state will have 10 minutes each. We have a timer, please. Pay attention to the timer, and we have simultaneous interpretation and also uh, subtitles. This hearing is being broadcasted on webcast, and the recording will be in the YouTube channel of the Commission. I will request you to turn on your cameras and be careful when your microphones when you're not speaking. Now we will start with the participation of the civil society for 20 minutes. Good afternoon and other representatives of the Commission delegation of the Mexican state interested parties that are following us. I am Alejandra Elizalde and I'm going to present the general frameworks that we're going to present in this hearing. Today, 32 organizations, networks and collectives from the civil society are present today that work for the protection of persons in human mobility in Mexico. Do our during our presentation, we're going to analyze human rights of persons, migrants in Mexico, focus on the militarization of the border control in Mexico and the effects on the different rights and the systematic uh, practice of pushback or uh, territorial rejection through um, different means and restriction of access. This commission has received information regarding the militarization through the creation of the National Guard with a focus uh, accompanied on different legislation with efficiencies and information regarding a military framework. And recently they stated that the CDL is going to participate in this process as well and the emphasis in uh, civil, uh, civic activities. We want to highlight the approach of this pol migration policy, especially the militarization deployment of armed forces in the territory that has affected borders in order to contain um, migration. In 2019, after a migration agreement between the United States and Mexico, 6,000 guards were deployed in the northern and southern borders and national guard continues to operate for example in may 2021 of the 100 thousand uh, guards most of them are located in the borders in the north and the south take into account the reports the national guards have supported the nari after supposedly rescuing persons in the south border implementing different practices that go against international standards. Also, there is an existence of contradictory information regarding the actual activities carried out by these organizations to control migration. They recognize the participation of this CDN, while this organization also points out 
that 150,000 people were rescued with the participation of the National Guard and different national organizations. So there's an uncertainty regarding this, their mandate. And also these statistics point out that the strategy has a security approach that deepens insecurity. Although armed forces say that they only participate to um, protect and guarantee security in the operations with the Navy, we have documented that they have actively participated in repression activities and detention of migrants. That is to say, there is a lack of transparency and control of the activities carried out by these organizations. Also, there is a concern regarding uh, efficient mechanisms to control uh, the security forces. The National Guard has uh, denied the use of excessive force, but the uh, Commission C and the H has registered different activities carried out by this institution. 20% are uh, related to their practice against migrants. The control of the National Guard is not adequate out of 8,800 files regarding complaints, only six cases were uh, uh, investigated. Thank you. This has resulted in an environment of impunity and lack of accountability. The deployment of militarization, the arbitrary access uh, control over their activities violates the rights of migrants. We want to highlight the following problems. Firstly, militarization of migration activities, assigning military profiles to 18 of 32 federative activities. Secondly, the deployment of militarized forces exacerbated uh, the uh, excessive use of force against migrants, as in January 2020, when persons were crossing in different municipalities and were um, violently attacked by the uh, National Guard. Thus, the CNDH, we issued a recommendation for the Secretary of C Citizenship, Citizen Protection, um, alleging different, um, and asking, requesting the guarantee of the rights of these persons as well of adolescents and children. The excessive use of force by this organization is also related to the activities to prevent uh, uh, strikes and demonstrations carried out by these persons in detention centers. For example, there was a protest to, uh, to um, protest against the quality of the food they received and the conditions of their um, refuge of the refugee centers. And these persons were made to lay down on the floor. They were threatened, have been beaten, and the testimonies and photographs point out to, parti to the participation of the National Guard and the Navy. The participation of the National Guard to control and verify migration activities def deepened um, racial profiling. We They had requested uh, IDs in circumstances that contradict with uh, local standards. For example, they have detained indigenous persons uh, by claiming they are persons coming from Central America due to the geographical position of the control, it seems that they are aimed at controlling the persons that may be migrants, and these criteria are discriminatory. The use of force accompanied by the use of racial profiling is uh, within the framework of what is called uh, a rescue. For example, the murder of Elis Masariebo on behalf of the army, before the facts, the Secretary of National Defense recognized that the elements had a wrong reaction that caused the death of this person. Also, police brutality showed racial uh, uh, systemic racism within um, the police. For example, the murder of Victoria Salazar caused by police officers. There's a bill in the Senate to substitute um, migration centers for uh, protection of migrants, which shows that these are policies that are aimed at, at uh, maintaining these violations of human rights as they do not guarantee the enjoyment of human rights, militarization of borders, 
and other actions have caused a climate of hostility. Also, the activities of monitoring assistance and that guarantee the defense of human rights, the deployment of these armed forces and their attribution in terms of migration is translated in a violation of human rights and the use of force as a way to contain migration. And these are policies based on discriminatory criteria. I will now give the floor to my colleague. Thank you. These policies to con contain migrant flows that have been implemented have impacts on the guarantees to access the Mexican territory. There are practices that are carried out by the Mexican state called territorial rejection or pushback for persons that need international protection. We would like to show the testimony of a family that has been the uh, victims of rejection in the South border. We left our country our country of origin, leaving everything behind due to safety reasons. As we are going through a situation of risk, we search for information online in the Comar website, migration website, and we were closely reading all the requirements, how to make the application, how we could enter Mexico. We had prepared all the documentation, passports, ID, everything. We even have the birth certificates of our children to prove that they are our biological children. But we were rejected. We were ill-treated. They uh, ins insulted us. And we go, go through an inhuman treatment. They didn't allow us to take water for several hours. We went through Mexico and we went into migration offices. The policemen that were there, even the staff in charge of hygiene, security, all of them started taking pictures with the cell phones to all of us, even the children, a person that works for migration uh, told us that they couldn't let us in that day. They told us that we seemed as victims of trafficking, that we couldn't go into Mexico that day. And they said that they could receive us in groups, number groups, they said we were group number one was going to enter the next day, group number two the following day, group three, three days later. And that's how we were able to enter Mexico. We request the authorities to train the staff, the officials that work in migration issues, the police officers, whether they are federal, state or municipal, officers so that they have more humanity. Regarding um, returnees, the uh, persons that go through the South border, one out of three persons coming from Central America into the countries of the border, we have uh, received a rejection for request, asylum requesters, and the United is not um, receiving a request for refugee. For example, the uh, border in Chiapas violating international standards and the legislation of Mexico, in particular, the non-rejection principle or non-reformment principle. The pandemic has been used to uh, forbid territorial access to um, uh, the access to the country through land access. The INAVI also promotes the um, entering of uh, these migrants through different points expose them to different uh, criminal activities. In particular, children, adolescents, and their families. There's a discretional uh, you, management of access to the territory, and these persons are rejected in the borders, and they are subject to families. They're separated from their family members 
in terms of children migrants that prohibits uh, the detention of children and adolescents, we have registered that the uh, methods to determine um, whether these children are accompanied by the relatives uh, violates the, la the rights of children and as a consequence, families are separated, causing physical and mental consequences. Also, there are illegal uh, and arbitrary practices such as uh, enter fees, as there are many persons trying to enter per day. So they are divided in smaller groups, violating the principle of family unity. I will now give the floor to my colleague. Thank you. The civil society has observed the different regulations established by the Navi in the different uh, airports when it comes to the access of persons that require international protection, which does not comply uh, with the non-full uh, reformment principle. There's a line in which the migration authority asks questions if persons consider, if the staff considers that the person does not comply with entering requirements, they can send them to a second interview uh, that is more detailed and will request them to present uh, further information or data. As these are asylum, uh, persons that request asylum, they can ask for international protection, but in the airports, uh, persons present their requests before the INABI agents and um, as they do not, they're not aware of the different procedures, they deny their access. And also ask people to um, leave their intentions behind and go back to their countries. This especially affects non uh, Spanish-speaking populations, and many persons that still want to request asylum, they are detained illegally in the airport in terrible conditions for days or even months. This situation in the cases in which persons are transferred to air provisionary instances and in the detention conditions, are inhumane. These situations are translated in a series of human rights violations that will be described by my colleague. We have accompanied the uh, desire of, uh, and were in communicated in rooms with artificial lights and turned on during 24 hours with no showers, no place to sleep or adequate food. In many of these cases, the INAMI staff recommended the people uh, and threatened them to uh, separate them from their families, damage their property and damage their pets if they didn't. Now, it is very important to bear in mind the quickness with which pushbacks occur, both terrestrially and uh, by air. People who are expelled from the national territory are deprived of the possibility of defending themselves from these practices, perpetuating the uh, practices against them. Pushbacks could be uh, um, Inter, could be dealt with through injections, but usually the legal aspects is not involved because if a person is at an, a Mexican airport has not entered the national territory, the same applies for a person who has been returned abroad and they consider that the trial is uh, does not apply. When the courts do issue precautionary measures, by the time this legal order reaches a point of access, the person has already been expelled from the country and this renders the process ineffective. This involves a multiplicity of factors that uh, speaks about the illegitimacy of pushbacks. In for the first place, the right to asylum by the migratory authorities and the National Guard. Secondly, the difference between the legal entering and the physical entering of the people into the territory. And thirdly, the absence of Comar and other institutions that defends human rights at airports. I would like to give the floor to Gabriela Oviedo. Thank you very much. Finally, the systematic practice of um, 
hot returns of people who are trained in uh, border control converge as a series of public policies that seek to criminalize uh, this, the seeking of international protection. These policies fit into a strategy of externalizing migratory control in order to stop these mixed flows. As this honorable commission has already seen, measures must be applied to ensure territorial access and the access also to migratory processes and international protection. All of this with a differentiated approach and with spaces that provide specific protection mechanisms. In compliance with the considerations, we request that the Commission do the following. First of all, verify the following the follow up provided by the Mexican state to the recommendations issues by the Inter American System of Human Rights regarding the uh, violation of migrant uh, people, migrant population. Also, an in loco visit to the Mexican territory. Secondly, uh, regarding hot returns, it issued a thematic report on this practice in the region. Thirdly, the following actions are requested. The management of uh, these actions only to the competent authorities and limiting the uh, involvement of militarized corporations. Then the total budget that is awarded to the National Guard and the number of detentions regarding uh, this process and also the training provided in terms of human rights. See, it eliminates the racial profiling measures and providing specific measures to eliminate xenophobia. Investigating denouncements made uh, for violations against human rights and also the arbitrary uh, deprivations of freedom. In order, in order to do this, it must access, it must ensure the access of threats and the non-repetition of acts. Then it investigates cases of pushbacks against migrant populations and F, generate protocols so that the authorities with which it works in the points of entry can identify those people who need international protection. And G, it ensures that com the presence of Komar at the borders. With this, we finalize our intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much to the representatives of the civil society and thank you very much for managing time so well. I would like to give the floor to the representatives of the state. Thank you very much. I apologize for the delay. Um, my connection had problems, so I'm using my partners. Dear commissioners, and representatives of the civil society and representatives of everyone who is following this hearing. The Mexican delegation is conformed by Cynthia Perez Trejo from the Mexican Commission of Refugee Aid, Mr. Villanueva Castilleja from the National Migration Institute, Luis Saturo Cortez Rosa from the Office of Migratory Policy, and Facundo Santillan Curian from the Secretariat of Security and Citizens Protection. And I will give them the floor in that order and request that they comply with the time established by the Commission. We begin then with Cynthia Perez. Go ahead. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From the beginning of this administration, the government of Mexico has expressed repeatedly each of its objectives, including to be a hospitable country in keeping with its long-standing tradition of an asylum provider. In 2020, the system of international protection was identified as an essential activity that allowed to maintain the borders open and request uh, uh, and receive requests. Despite the pandemic, which significantly reduced by 40% the number of uh, refugee seekers in 2020, during the first five months of the ongoing year, we have registered about more than 41,000 people who requested the uh, condition to be considered as refugees. We have almost reached the total number of last year. So in a preliminary manner, we arrive at the following conclusions. With the beginning of the vaccine plan and the lifting of restrictions, uh, there is a new increase in the number of those who request asylum and who come to Mexico in search for protection. The hurricanes that affected uh, communities in the north of Central Americas have generated conditions 
especially in Honduras and El Salvador, forced displacements towards Mexico. The profound economic crisis brought about by the pandemic has made people move, not just for economic reasons, but also in the struggle for resources. This increases violence and violations against human rights not just for those who come from Central America, but also from Haiti, Cuba, and Venezuela. As a whole, they represent 86% of the total people who are requesting asylum. Out of the total people who have registered as uh, petitioners of asylum, 72% have done so through the Office of Representation in Chiapas. This entity concentrates the highest number of requests at a national level, despite the measures, the sanitary measures imposed during the pandemic and the restrictions coordinated by the authorities in Central America in the face of announcements during the first uh, two months of this year. Taking into consideration the number of foreign people who are seeking protection by the Mexican government and the measures established by the health authorities in the context of the pandemic, the state is working on the following strategies. Implementation of a plan to strengthen the care for those seeking uh, refugee status that access through the south southern border. The, Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees is increasing its capacity to address and help refugees uh, with its offices in Capachula and Chiapas and Tenoxique, Tabasco, both in the registration of new requests and in the resolution of new procedures. We are also processing uh, cases efficiently by developing tools authorized by law to protect refugees and political uh, asylum seekers within the framework of international policies. This has reduced the time to address the cases, and uh, as a result, they are not lagging behind as much as they did. More than 24,000 procedures were solved, including resolution that uh, considered them refugees or provided additional assistance. We are prioritizing the mechanisms to alternatives for accommodation so that the, those persons seeking refugee status who are in migration centers have an authorization to stay in an adequate space during the contingencies so that they can avoid contagions and maintain social distance. At the end of 2020, we managed an alternative for to accommodate more than 3,000 people who were required requesting their uh, refugee status. In keeping with the RENAPU, the Population Registry, we implemented a program, a pilot program, that allows those requesting uh, refugee status and additional protection to obtain their single registry key so that they can access this in a quick manner. Within these processes, we have promoted the training of officials at all levels of authority especially in the region, including the border uh, with Belize and Guatemala, which includes 23 municipalities. The goal is to raise awareness and improve the institutions to promote the respect for human rights. Without a doubt, the system of international protection is facing different challenges, especially those deriving from the increase in requests for refugee status. In 2018, there were more than 29,000 requests, and in 2019, this rose to more than 70,000. And by 2020, with the dramatic reduction caused by the pandemic, it was only 41,000. And in what goes of 2021, the first five months, more than 41,000 people have requested this status. It is relevant to mention that we have engaged in coordination with civil society organizations, international organizations, and authorities from different areas of government in order to access uh, the, the uh, ensuring of uh, the protection of these people, especially in the border of Mexico with Guatemala and the international airport. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Villanueva, go ahead. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, commissioners. The government of Mexico has a regulatory framework that is in keeping with the statute for refugees, which stipulates the respect and protection of the human rights of those people in a context of mobility and specifically recognizes their right to access justice and due process by incorporating within the administrative processes of migration a wide range of rights 
including a clear access to international protection systems and the protection of migrant children, as well as an application of gender perspective, non-discrimination, and eight human rights principles, which uh, lead to protection of the rights of people in a context of migration. The measures adopted by this institute have as a basis a human rights approach in order to uh, assume these responsibilities and ensure a dignified treatment of those people entering the country, as well as control verification uh, that have taken place in keeping with the law. Within this logic, the National Migration Institute is committed to notifying the initiation of any administrative process and facilitate protection from the consulate and assist legally uh, these people on the procedures that have started that are ongoing, enable the presence of an interpreter and assist with phone communications. Also ensuring them legal assistance and help uh, for all arbitrations. There's also a guarantee of uh, all the due procedures and to uh, provide a basis for the decisions to appeal with a basis on human rights and to define all of these procedures. In Mexico, the review of documentation of those people who seek to come to our country is part of the actions of migratory control. When exercising this attribution, the migration authorities, when they see that the person that's seeks to enter the territory does not meet the fulfillments or the, the requirements or is not presenting the appropriate documentation there is a second instance and when we are talking about petitioners of international protection the migration authorities conducts an interview and is, writes down a uh, uh, a document and then the person uh, there is a notification sent to Komar so that they can uh, address the situation and so that the petitioner can receive the status of visitor for humanitarian reasons until their migratory situation is solved. These procedures and these documentations of those who are seeking international protection is in general under the non refoulement uh, clause uh, where the Mexican uh, state uh, is part of. So the execution of a migratory control, especially the second part with respect to rejection or admission must not be understood as a measure to annul the possibility of foreign uh, citizens uh, seeking international protection. Although administrative capacities have been overwhelmed by uh, the international situation, this has extended the time dedicated to certain procedures. However, the state is working in collaboration with other offices and uh, with other international organizations in order to expand their capacities and be able to address all of the uh, issues uh, even those that are unexpected. The Mexican state has promoted several actions to ensure a, an orderly, regular and safe migration process where human rights of the people are respected. And emphasizing the following ones, the creation of a protocol to uh, address the needs of international protection of women, children and adolescents and not separate them. A protocol to ensure the respect for rights and for principles and the protection of women, children and adolescents during these processes. A protocol to employ resources to rescue and provide care and protection to the victims of human trafficking a guideline for the uh, for addressing these vulnerable uh, people in a context of migration all of this in order to establish actions and to have officials implement them to uh, and observe the establishments of the decree the laws for refugees and everything pertaining political uh, asylum seekers, uh, all of them issued in November 2020. These documents were developed in collaboration with different organizations, both at a national and international levels, uh, including uh, UN um, offices. The procedure to request the condition of refugee in Mexico have led to the strengthening of these measures and uh, 
also uh, establish uh, different methods such as TV sets to uh, explain the different procedures, etc. There is a training program that is ongoing with respect to international protection and human rights. And this in the process of November 25th and May 2021, more than 1300 public servers of the National Migration Institute defined a course for uh, profile, racial profiling and human trafficking with an equality and respect for human rights approach. Another important action is the program for uh, alternative accommodation where there are options in migratory centers for those people who are from abroad and are undergoing these procedures. This program have benefited almost 1900 people between July 2016 and April 2021. Since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the National Migration Institute together with the health authorities have developed a procedure to control the outbreak, establishing healthcare measures that should be applied in the areas destined for international transit of people. This in order to avoid the spread of this virus. Within the same context, the Institute conducted a protocol to deal with uh, suspected cases and confirmed cases of COVID-19 in migration stations. And uh, this in collaboration with the International Red Cross and the Secretariat of Health. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mexican state uh, reiterates its commitment in keeping with the mechanisms of international coordination to safely return those foreign people who are in our country with an irregular migratory condition, except for those who are under the principle of international protection. For them, we have entered into international agreements with uh, countries such as El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, and Cuba, and also Ecuador. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Luz Arturo Cortez, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and commissioners. Taking into account the complexity of migration and also the need to cooperate between the nation to protect the rights of migrant people, one of the spaces for dialogue currently is the Regional Conference of Migration, where Mexico will be the president during 2021. In the deployment of forces as a national mechanism, the state did not have evidence on a regional policy to deploy armed forces to, with the aim of doing that uh, reformment. Assisted return it depends on migration authorities and is carried out in a coordinated way with other countries in the region. We need to bear in mind that massive uh, flows have increased the pressure on the uh, state of Mexico since the uh, ac current administration took office. It has seek to protect the protection, uh, protect human rights of these persons in order to carry out safe. Um, acts uh, entering mechanisms to our country. The migration policy that we have implemented through the sectorial mobilization program recognizes that the phenomenon of migration is a problem of shared responsibility that requires the cooperation of all states to deal with the factors that make people leave their countries. Thus, before um, restrictive uh, migration policy in the US, different countries in the region subscribe to uh, agreements with this country. The government of Mexico, out of um, humanitarian reasons, has received uh, migrations following the protocols that are implemented by the US. Complying with human rights protection, we have a pilot program to coordinate, coordinated by the Secretary of Human Rights with the uh, Agency of Mexico for International Cooperation, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the German Agency for Development. Based on that, this uh, unit of migration policy registers the identity of the mi migrants have 
uh, participated in the program in order to fight against discrimination in the South border in Mexico. Thank you. Dr. Santillan, please. Yes, good afternoon to everyone. The National Guard is an administrative uh, body the concentrated of the security uh, secretariat for the protection of the citizenship that can contribute to the National Migration Institute, but that does not mean that the authorities, security authorities, can independently carry out um, different activities such as migration control. The National Guard law and migration law take into account coordinated activities with the uh, Institute. That does not mean that the Guard acts independently taking into account that its own only role is to provide support to the institute that task is carried out by respecting human rights and um, we disregarding the origin nationality gender of the or migration situation of the person and that is all i have to say thank you thank you Thank you to the Commission. Thank you, Ambassador. I will now give the floor to uh, Fernandez Maldonado for seven minutes. Good afternoon. I want to especially greet the authorities of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the authorities and representatives of the state, and the representatives of the civil society. It is an honor to be with you in this public hearing during the 180 period of sessions regarding the protection of human rights of the persons in a, a situation of human mobility in Mexico. As a representative in Mexico of the Office of the High Commissioner of the United States for Human Rights, I am here to share information informally without being under oath about the situation of human rights of the persons in human mobility situation. My comments should not be understood as uh, disclaimer of the uh, human rights and the aim of the hearing is to identify different forms observed in Mexico that hinder access to the territory of persons in human mobility situation as a special rapporteur has uh, of the UN for migrants has pointed out these practices known as uh, pushbacks make persons in human mobility uh, return to their countries from which they have crossed or they have crossed an international border without international protection. These imply uh, that they are expelled without uh, analyzing their cases. And this could hinder uh, their um, right to request asylum, Mexico, that ratifies the migration pact. It is a country of origin, transit, and also it is a place where there are many returnees. This year, this has been an unprecedented increase of persons coming to the country and also of asylum requests. I want to highlight two areas that uh, about which there should be measures implemented regarding the protection of human rights, migration control and the participation of farm forces in the control of frontiers. In order to have a regulated and secure migration, there should be a human rights approach putting persons at the center. The state has implemented different actions in order to uh, include this approach in their policies, for example, in the systems of asylum, but still they favor the deployment of the armed forces and other police uh, security forces to control borders. This response does not contribute to the efforts to guarantee a safe migration process. The absence of uh, adequate accountability process show the risk for this approach to be translated into uh, pushback practices. Our office has received information and documented 
information in the border and migration centers without uh, due diligence guarantees. The office has received information about these practices based on uh, racial profiling. When these occur, there is no individual or partial uh, partial investigation complying with the international rights of migrants and other humanitarian criteria. There is no access uh, investigation that is effective and there is no a guarantee of a legal representative. And there are also collective expels. It is a shared goal to prevent these practices, to make sure that persons in situation of human mobility have access to uh, protection mechanisms and legal resources so that authorities can uh, state their uh, status after identifying the need in, with an, uh, in an individual manner. It is key for them to access civil society organizations and uh, mechanisms to access justice. The office considers there are still uh, many challenges regarding access to justice for these persons. Also, we are aware of human rights violations and violence uh, against persons. Camargo, for example, in January 2021, and we have documented obstacles for the migrants' access to justice and their relatives, especially difficulties to access justice for persons that are detained in migration centers and irregular, irregularity regarding their legal representation. To conclude, the, go the challenge is to make sure that or in all cases, there is an individual analysis of the needs of these persons regarding their uh, need for international protection. In order to prox pro progress, we need to include the civil society uh, in terms of reviewing uh, these policies. This hearing is a space to have a fruitful dialogue among the different actors to uh, take measures and prevent these practices. Thank you for the opportunity of participating in this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez Maldonado. We will now start with the participation of the commission. I will now give the floor to the country reporter and reporter on the rights of the children, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena. Thank you, Madam President. First, Vice President of our commission, I want to greet all the organizations. There is an important number of organizations that have made this request, that have requested this hearing, acknowledging the work due to the complexity of the topic. I want to express the value your work has to the honorable representation of the Mexican state. Thank you on behalf of the commission to um, the ambassador. Thank you for your presence and for the detailed presentation made by the state. And to all my colleagues and members of the Inter-American Commission, I always forget to mention them because as we were talking at the beginning, I forgot to greet them, including our colleagues and the staff, and also the representative of the High Commissioner on Human Rights uh, in Mexico. It is a great opportunity to listen to your perspective. Regarding human mobility, this is a complex issue, as you have pointed out. All have pointed, have described this as a complex situation that requires a shared responsibility, a need to have regional perspective of what dealing with this situation implies and when persons 
Most persons talk about migration. They ask, why do they leave if there are so many problems? What we need to ask is, there are so many problems in their countries of origin, and that's why they seek a possibility of a new life. So it's not an easy task when we talk about thousands of persons that are going through this process, thousands of persons that need answers that are simple, such as the right to life, the right to have a space that is safe for them to live in. The complexity leads to the need of having a comprehensive perspective to be committed. There should be a shared responsibility in this regarding this issue. I think that is the possible answer to have a shared responsibility. Undoubtedly, what the different organizations from the civil society have described. I'm going to make a comment or question. Is there a development of all these, of all these actions that are within the framework of legality that are aimed at protecting rights is there a violation of this legislation by the institutions, whether it is the Institute of Migration or the National Guard or the Army? Have you registered these kind of violations about the situation they are going through, the testimonies, the testimony you have shown today well you have to train this stuff it means there's an answer and maybe it is not present in the terms established by the legislation if these situations are registered by the institute or national institute of migration icomar or the state organizations? Are they being investigated? Do you have records of these pushbacks that should not have and do not have a legal basis because returnees should be protected my question is that one. Is there a record of this violation of rights regarding the group of migrants that suffer these hot returns or rejections? I think that persons are being pushed. If that is not carried out by following protocols, measures established by the government. Is that investigated by the Mexican state? Has the state identified this situation? Otherwise, There is contradictory information between what civil society says and what the uh, state institutions state. And the last point, I'm sorry, uh, Madam President, it is related to information regarding the group of uh, boys, girls, and adolescents as a group of high vulnerability regarding these 
policies, there was a reform of the law, but we see that, that there is no protection, there is no adequate response. There are protocols to deal with this differentiation, but we need to have detailed information about this. That is part of the work that we should carry out jointly. Why the protection of childhood situation is not being guaranteed if the civil society says, mentions the number of children that are suffering the separation from their families by violating the legislation. That complexity, we need to find common ground in order to improve the adequate response. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner. I will now give the floor to the second Vice President, Commissioner Flavia Piovesan. Thank you, Madam President, our first Vice President. I want to greet the civil society organizations, the uh, Commission for the Protection of Human Rights, all the other uh, organizations, the representatives of the state, our dear Ambassador Selena, and also Mr. Guillermo Maldonado, representative of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Mexico. I have three concerns. The first one has to do with the pushback policy. I took down notes of the strengthening plan regarding asylum, uh, pilot projects, protocols for boys, girls, and adolescents, protocols regarding But my question is, if the state has a perspective to eliminate the pushback practice, whether they access through land or air, because I share the concern expressed by Mr. Maldonado. There is a summary automatic expulsion without protecting due process and risking the principle of non refoulement That is my first concern. Also, bearing this in mind, we would like to know if the state has a number, the figures regarding those persons that were expelled that were not granted access. And secondly, regarding that militarization approach, civil society expressed that there is a militarization approach with armed forces, the inadequate use of force. And apart from the plans to strengthen the system of asylum, the pilot programs, protection policies, what are the other measures adopted by the state to guarantee there's an approach focused on the person, that person in a human mobility situation with a human rights approach. Thirdly, the intersectionality and the special protection for groups and persons in a situation of vulnerability as being the rapporteur on LGBTI persons, the rapporteur receives complaints regarding violation of rights. And I would like to know if apart from those specific protocols for the protection of girls, boys, and adolescents and trafficking victims, if you have a protocols to protect LGBTI persons that suffer discrimination, violence, stigmatization due to their sexual orientation or gender identity, and 
we listened to a video, it was a um, really moving video. I took down note of what they said, training the staff, the officials that work in migration agencies, the police, if you have training programs, because I agree with what Commissioner Esmeralda, my dear colleague, has said, we have legal adequate uh, frameworks, but if there's a culture, a prevailing culture that does not have a sexual orientation approach and does not take uh, into account these cases that weakens Thank you very much, the uh, protection of the rights. Commissioner Radom. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you very much to all the organizations and representatives of the state. I would basically like to mention that uh, this major challenge, although there are several efforts that have been mentioned and even conditions that are not adequate in uh, the detention, if the organizations could maybe specify a bit more and maybe what happens with unaccompanied minors. That is when an unaccompanied minor is there, what is the situation that takes place? Is there a pushback? Is there a detention um, at a center, at a separate center or together with adults? And how are these detention centers or what are the conditions, et cetera, for these minors? Thank you very much. I have some questions as a rapporteur uh, and I would like to be part of my uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone for uh, participating and also the organizations of the civil society, not just for their presence here today, but also for the constant work and the support that is provided to so many people in these conditions. I would like to just share specific questions. First of all, I would like to remind how uh, there is this uh, resolution for 2019 and that this resolution must be observed by the states, especially non-discrimination, protection, unaccompanied minors, etc. Secondly, uh, regarding what Commissioner Pioveza uh, said, I would like to request these uh, data, but I would like to request them in a disaggregated manner to know exactly which ones, uh, and especially vulnerable populations, which ones are mostly affected. Thirdly, uh, the issue specifically of sexual violence, as mentioned by uh, Fernandez, Mr. Fernandez Maldonado regarding violations of human rights, specifically sexual violence and gender violence, but especially because of the consequences that can take place like unwanted pregnancies. So in that sense, what is the state's response, especially in terms of sexual and reproductive health? Another issue, and in this sense, I would like to also second Mr. Maldonado, uh, taking into consideration that Mexico is an origin country, a transit country and a return country. Uh, and we know of the case of Camargo, is, et cetera. We would like to express also the collaboration of the IACHR in terms of training specifically, but we are specifically interested in this uh, violations of human rights that can occur during the entire transit, threats, uh, violence in general, discrimination, and these specific situations. So within this context, in addition to pushbacks, which is a topic that has already been mentioned, it's the migratory stations, which are the alternatives. Migration stations, they're not detention centers, although they're called that way in certain places. They are temporary centers, which must ensure all guarantees, especially in the context of a pandemic. So these points and this information, I would like to have it uh, and both from the state and also contributions from the civil society. So right now I would like to ask the secretary of uh, monitoring, uh, Claudia Pulis, if she has any comments. Yes. 
Thank you very much, Madam President of this hearing. I would like to greatly welcome and greet all the people who are participating today, just for informative purposes and with respect to the issues discussed during this hearing, I would like to mention that the Commission conducted a virtual visit in Mexico in December of 2020 and January 2021. During that context of the virtual visit that was focused on human mobility, the Mexican state uh, approved the organization of an on-site visit uh, by the IACHR. And we believe that this is very relevant. Just to mention that we had only have to define the dates for that visit. So thank you, President, that is all. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary, Rapporteur Soledad Garcia. Go ahead. Madam President, thank you very much. Warm greetings to all the participants of this hearing today and also commissioners and my colleague, exec, uh, the uh, Joint Executive Secretary. I have three specific comments taking into account the importance that this issue has and that we work closely with Commissioner Mantilla because human mobility regarding the issues of Redesca is a very important matter. And within the first concern for civil society, which is, in your opinion, the main obstacles or concerns that you have regarding this population, particularly respect to access to health, water, food, education, because I understand that you've referred to this population specifically which is being uh, returned yes these hot returns but uh, i have that this concern and also for the state what are the main measures and challenges that you are facing especially to protect the right to health of this population which are in a situation of human mobility i am especially interested in hearing about the vaccine plans uh, if there are any vaccination plans and what the recommendations are regarding the resolution 1 slash 2021. Finally, Madam President, for this mandate, uh, for uh, it is is very important to consider uh, uh, the issue of this growing human mobility in Central America and Mexico, and therefore, we highly appreciate the fact that the state has recognized that poverty, inequality, and environmental issues are the, the problems generating this exodus of people massively, and which, as a consequence, uh, must be faced with shared responsibility. We are creating reports from Redesca, and uh, uh, we are, of course, open to receiving information from the state on these important development actions for Central America and Mexico. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Rapporteur. Civil Society, 10 minutes. Thank you very much. We appreciate those questions. I will particularly refer to the concern that we still have, and Commissioner Flavia just mentioned this regarding the militarized security policies that are uh, implemented here uh, for migration. And we do not have much information about it. This commission has said this repeatedly regarding how uh, the choice of military profiles for these positions are not the most adequate choices for migratory stations, but we still see here, not just in the terrain, but we see them uh, doing uh, tasks that have to do with migration. As the state mentioned, the National Guard, Guard um, was uh, commissioned the task of doing these reviews, but they cannot do this without acting in coordination with the National Institute. However, based on the information that we have, the situation is different. The National Migration Institute mentions uh, seeing, for example, for example, 300, more than 300 people, but uh, there is a very different number. So the numbers vary. This is the main point. And uh, what we believe is that probably they are doing isolated tasks and there is no coordination with the National Institute where the numbers are completely different. The same goes with the National Guard. The National Migration Institute 
says that 2,000 people were presented while the National Guard it mentions more than 21,000 people who have been detained by this institution. So what we consider is that protocols and trainings are not sufficient because we, as has been mentioned by the commission during the virtual visit, many of the protocols that have been mentioned do not involve the National Guard and that we have received no information regarding uh the protocols but also information that has to do with trainings or if they are part of uh, activities that have to do with gender and non-discrimination evidently this is not sufficient especially when we have no adequate controls of these institutions i think this has been said time and time again by this commission and we are particularly concerned about this, especially when seeing that more than 20% of the complaints received by the National Human Rights Commission and uh, on the National Guard are regarding migrant populations. And internal controls are not sufficient. The National Guard has opened 4,000 internal files, case files, and uh, very few have undergone a control process. And even the head of this organization has had accusations of torture. So these are the organizations of su uh, in charge of supervising and uh, they, they, uh, they have different accusations and we haven't heard a response regarding how to follow up on the reports and the access to justice by this population. Also, regarding the concerns of Rapporteur Flavia Bresan, uh, it is important to mention that between January and April, we presented more than 56,000 events of people who uh, presented themselves before the migration authorities. More than 50% were deported uh, with the assisted return policy, and only 917 have uh, had uh, this. Uh, situation. So this allows us to see how complicated it can be for a person to enter the procedure of to be a refugee or uh, enjoy this type of protection. Omar uh, has only 50.8 million and we don't know the budget of the National Migration Institute, but we think that it's more than 1.6 billion, which is uh, also complement by other funds and the collaboration that they have with the National Guard shows certain elements and they are at the disposal for the work that has been done. Alejandra Macias, I will focus on the uh, alternative accommodation program or detention alternative program. On October 27, 2020, the National Migration Institute issued an official letter explaining the many restrictions for people to enjoy these uh, type of programs. This program could have been uh, a, a very good program that could have been replicated in other countries as a good practice. However, it is no longer the case. The people who can benefit from this uh, program are very few. The people who have uh, a registry of migration control will not will not be able to access this program, and those who have a rejection determination at that point issued by a competent authority will not be able to be part of this program. It is important to mention that those who are traveling alone and in a regular manner, and who do not show some a situation of vulnerability that is fully uh, established or have no administrative or legal resource, they could not, they will not be able to benefit from this program. So this is in contradiction with the Refugee Law or the Refugee Act, because the Refugee Act establishes that those people who enter irregularly will be able to access the asylum process. It is important to mention that in migration stations, there are people who enter regularly. Therefore, people who come in through the airport and who come with a tourist visa, 
visa to the country are being detained in migration stations, especially those who are Venezuelan in Monterrey. This is a high concern because they shouldn't have, they shouldn't be detained. Those people who have a migration document that is uh, valid. We have cases of people who have been in these stations for a long time under these conditions. And we have mentioned this many times. They are under conditions which, in spite of the pandemic, they do not have the inputs uh, for a proper uh, protection against COVID. In the case of children and adolescents who shouldn't be in migration stations, they continue to be uh, detected by the National Migration Institute. And although they, uh, I mean, they are being taken to areas that have been identified for this purpose, but without the proper conditions for a dignified stay. Thank you. Regarding the rejection at borders uh, when accessing by land, what we've observed in the organized civil society, we observed lack of interinstitutional organization to ensure the access to the territory in different moments. On the one hand, when the people show up at the regular points of entry, as we've observed in the testimony, even with documents, we must recognize that due to the violence situations, there are multiple uh, factors. And sometimes uh, people who run away from their countries, sometimes they cannot run away from with, with their documents. And it is the obligation of the state to admit them while they uh, secure the uh, recovery of that documentation. Between February and this year, we've had we have supported the different families in the uh, border bridge, and we have uh, assisted in certain systematic rejections. And on the one hand, we observe that the National Migration Institute, although they have uh, the legal basis. In the practices, we've seen a reiterated a violation of law 21 of the refugee protection law and asylum law. Uh, and the authorities of the National Migration Institute refused to report this in writing and immediately to Komar. Even despite the support of civil society organizations, we have witnessed the, uh, ev the expelling of uh, families pregnant women at the border bridge by applying discretionary principles. And also, it is important to mention that those people who are not considered within a family group, although they might be family, uh, they go to detention. And with respect to children and adolescents, this lack of coordination between institutions is reflected in the fact that uh, the uh, care for children are not dealt with in the proper manner. And uh, the issuance of uh, the restitution of the current rights has been transferred, or most of that responsibility for the implementation of this reform has been transferred to the organized civil society. And so this is usually channeled. Uh, uh, children and adolescents are sent to these uh, places, but we've seen very few efforts to really generate dignified spaces. And we have even enabled certain emerging spaces. And as Alejandra mentioned, there, there are no conditions to access basic services. Thank you very much. Sorry, we, I can give you a few seconds, that's all maybe one minute. I just would like to say that the rest of the information regarding pushbacks or hot returns and also vaccination plans and the economic and social rights, all of that information will be sent by the organizations to the commission. Thank you very much. The state has the floor, 10 minutes. We have many, many questions and many of them are very important. I would like to ask you that your responses are very brief and that which we cannot answer now will be answered in writing. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to take this opportunity to refer to these issues. The Mexican Commission on Refugees, 
we will limit our intervention to three issues that were mentioned repeatedly. Firstly, the coordination with the National Migration Institute at the points of entry, depending on the uh, depending on whether they're uh, by air or by land. Institutionally, there have been uh, alternatives to accommodation that is exiting migration centers for those who are seeking international protection and interinstitutional uh, instances uh, that seek to ensure the promotion and access to rights, especially for the local integration of the uh, people and in keeping with the condition of refugee and beneficiaries and complementary assistance in Mexico. In terms of the access to procedure and the points of entry of those seeking uh, this status, Together with the National uh, Institute, there is coordination activities, and especially in certain cases where there have been coordinations with the organizations that are present here, to be able to ensure that they have access to the procedure. In those cases where there is little coordination and not much information on the procedure and the requirements to do it, we have maintained strong ties with the National Migration Institute to ensure the access to this procedure for those people who are um, having to stay at these centers. Among the strengthening actions carried out in this sense, we have had uh, discussions and talks with the organizations who support uh, these processes in order to explain what these rights are and what the importance is of accompanying legal assistance, legal representation with these associations in order to promote from all perspectives the defense of human rights and of those who are seeking international protection in our country. One of these measures of promotion and also which seek to protect the rights of people, but also in this context of a pandemic to ensure the health of people uh, are the alternatives to accommodation. As the National Migration Institute has mentioned and civil society organizations, this program has been valid uh, since 2016 and accumulating since until May this year. We have more than 19,000 cases that have been uh, seen as well as people who have exited migration stations and have had alternatives or have stayed not in these centers during the uh, development of the procedures. This has allowed a coordination, not just at the institute level and at the level of Comar, but also with civil society organizations and the High Commissioner of the United Nations for Refugees. So it is through these civil society organizations that cases are accompanied at accommodation centers that are very much in keeping with the needs of these people for this program. And I repeat, historically, since 2006, these alternatives have kept open during the pandemic and we have been identifying those persons that need to leave the station through these collaboration mechanisms with the uh, institute uh, pointing out who are these persons requesting these in the station so that we can coordinate an early uh, um, exit of these stations regarding access to health, work, education, and ID, and promotion of the rights of the persons uh, requesting asylum. The state and the administration, we have fostered coordination table interinstitutional ones with international organizations in the civil society to promote um, measures that are effective and lastly, to take care of the persons. And this at the federal level is coordinated by the Secretariat of uh, uh, Human Rights and at the national level, we have this coordination um, level. We have these tables in Chiapas, in Nuevo León, in Mexico City, and Secretary Encina is in charge of the, and we will open other uh, working tables in other states with the cooperation of these institutions and international organizations to guarantee uh, persons' human rights. The Kumar pointed out the project that exists to promote um, key for the persons that are requesting asylum or refugees, as this is a key right 
to access other series of rights that should be constitutionally guaranteed to migrants in Mexico. That is why this is one of the uh, priority measures at the national level and through the different coordination tables and the RENAPO and even in those places where there is there is not an, an office um, of representation of the Comar, we are fostering this program. Following the order we have mentioned, I would like to mention that in the Institute, I'm going to mention two points. Attention to girls, boys and adolescents, for example. The work carried out has been very important, as you know. We had a reform to Migration Act, and since January, we want to guarantee that no boy, girl, or adolescent is present in these migration stations. We need to keep on working on this, but there is no girl, boy, or adolescent in these migration stations. We need to keep on working so that this group is uh, has better conditions. We have signed agreements with the national if and other ones so that we can work hand in hand and we can protect childhood by the adequate institutions to receive the best attention possible we have signed an agreement with the secretariat of public education that is the only institution that can certify provide certification and we have developed the standard, we have worked in that sense, and we are waiting for this to be published in the official bulletin about the attention of girls, boys, and adolescents in a situation of migration. This will improve the participation. There, This will be shared with the staff of the Institute and the TIF the civil society that is also participating with whom we have worked so that we can have better results and of course with the different um, DA's office for the protection of childhood and regarding training officials the staff needs to be trained at all times recently we signed an agreement with the national uh, commission of human rights and we are working in order to train officials on uh, respect for human rights so that we can have the best results in that sense. And also certificates, not only for this population, someone mentioned the vulnerable uh, population or vulnerable groups. Mexico has guidelines for the protection of this population, several groups such as the elderly, persons with disabilities, women, pregnant women in particular, and these guidelines are the basis for the uh, development of programs so that we can provide training on human rights. We have limited time. Yes, and there are two officials missing. Thank you. Just one minute. I don't know if my, the other colleagues want to add more information. We would like to say that regarding migration policies, we they have been developed with a focus on human rights, a comprehensive approach, and we want this intersectionality to become visible regarding the all the possible situations that may affect migrants. Secondly, the data that are published officially, such as the statistics of the Mexican state, is based on the administrative register of the National Institution, Institute of Migration. And I want to say that uh, the power granted by the law are the development of public policies and not operation. That's why it is important to listen to the perspective of the institutions that are present today. Thank you. 
Thank you. We are out of time. Bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias. Vamos a llegar al término de esta audiencia. Yo quiero about to conclude this hearing. I want to say that the, the commission appreciates your participation. I also want to thank uh, Maria Claudia Pulido to remind us of the importance of this visit. We have to set the dates and the these resources that you have provided are very useful to design the methodology and the priorities of that visit. Taking into account what you have said about the participation of Mexico in the regional conference on migration, the commission is available to support you. And I want to thank the representatives of the state, the civil society organizations, Mr. Fernandez Maldonado, and in the rapporteur on human mobility, there are, we always say that there are many types of mobility, many circumstances, and we are all persons who have migrated. So I want to thank you for your attention and good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you.